Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this interview uh, with Mr. Christakis, Professor Christakis. This time two months ago, none of us really knew what flattening the curve meant. Now, we're flooded with hundreds of corona-related articles every day, all with their own little messages and stories. From the Washington couple who got married in the street, to someone suggesting that we could inject disinfectant into ourselves. No prizes <laughs> for guessing who. Trying to extract important nuggets of valuable information from this mess can be tricky. So our interview today is just simply about tapping into the knowledge and informed opinion of Yale professor Nicholas Christakis. Mr. Christakis is a sociologist and physician, and his research is on network science and biosocial science. It is involved evolutionary biology, sociology, sociobiology, and epidemiology. And it is this last one that we're going to focus on today. Mr. Christakis is definitely one of the people to talk about the corona crisis with. As always, we'd like to hear from you. So if you've got a question, just comment it on the, the Facebook live stream and we'll try and answer it. So, uh, Professor Christakis, thanks again uh, on my behalf as well. We want to dive right into it. Let's imagine it's December 31st, 2019, and you wake up one morning and you're actually in the presidential suite, you're the president of the United States, and the WHO is starting to report about coronavirus. What are your courses of action? Well, I think, um, first of all, that's not too far-fetched because we've been told that the CIA was briefing the president as early as December. The first known case of coronavirus occurred December the 1st, and certainly by January, by the middle of January, early January, the Chinese were quite aware of the magnitude and nature of the threat, including the human-to-human -human transmission, and it's likely, I would imagine, that the president of the United States would have had some such information. So your hypothetical is not totally crazy that, uh, you know, December 30th, such information would have been available. I think the crucial thing to do at that moment is to try to get a sense of how likely is this disease to be contained. Let's remember in 2003, there was another outbreak of SARS uh, that began in southern China. Uh, it was sort of SARS-1. Right now we have SARS-2. It also was a coronavirus that emerged from bats, uh, went, in that case, we think, through civets, a small nocturnal animal which was consumed as a delicacy in southern China and then spread to humans. But that epidemic was contained to about 8,500 people worldwide. Had very serious, uh, very similar symptoms. It had some different epidemiological parameters, which actually may help explain why that disease was contained and the current one was not. But the crucial thing to ask yourself on December 30th and in the couple of weeks thereafter is, what's the likelihood that this new pathogen will become a pandemic. Mm. And once you have evidence of human to human spread, you have to consider that possibility very seriously because it's in the nature of these things to spread. Remember, the viruses are living things too. They want to go, well, there's a debate as to whether virus is life or not, but for now, we can assume that they're living things and, um, and they're just going to do their thing. They're not going to respect political borders. And so over the course of, of about January, I was sort of aware of this epidemic beginning in the middle of January, January 24th or 25th, I was contacted by some Chinese colleagues with whom we've had a long-standing scientific collaboration in Hong Kong about the possibility of working on um, a project together, which actually was just out, just released a few hours ago at the journal Nature, uh, using phone data to track mm -hmm. the movement of people throughout China and, saw, and examine how when they moved from Wuhan, they carried the, the pathogen with them. And so I began to be, beginning January the 24th or 25th, to really pay careful attention to what was happening in China. And, uh, and I have a fair number of Chinese graduate students as well who were sort of letting me know and sharing photos with me of you know, empty streets and uh, uh, me social media posts from China and so forth. And, um, and it became clear to me that as of January the 25th, China passed rules that effectively locked down 930 million people. They effectively restricted almost a billion people to their own homes, and they just released those uh, lockdowns like in the last few weeks. So basically, China decided that the enemy they were facing in this virus was so powerful that they had to basically detonate a social nuclear bomb to stop it. They had to put a billion people in their homes and I was aware of this, you see, at the, by the end of January. And so it became very clear to me that all of the things that were happening in China would necessarily happen in the rest of the world, that there, this virus, the genie, had been let out of the bottle. So to, to return to your question, 
maybe not by December the 30th, although I would have been very alarmed by December 30th, but surely by December, by January the 15th, and certainly by January the 26th or 27th, um, you know, it was abundantly clear that this was a very serious threat um, to our, to us. Yeah, and a, and a and, policy um, prescription uh, on this, because we do want to kind of get your advice, because the China example is basically an example of pretty much, I could say authoritarian government using a tool yes. that only it can use, right? So if the United States had that ability, right, is that something that you think would have been useful, needed? No, so... Yeah, so, yeah, you're absolutely right that the, the Chinese response was abetted by their authoritarian form of government and their, also their collectivist norms. They're very rule-abiding. Mm -hmm. The Taiwanese are too, by the way. They do not have an authoritarian government. South Koreans as well. There are certain societies which are just much more willing to, you know, suppress individual liberty for the collective good. And the Chinese culture is one of those. So, so yes, you're right that those things, although we have other strengths in the West, that we can bring to bear and that unfortunately heretofore we've not really brought to bear. Example, we have a historic commitment to the freedom of speech and the right. and open communication. Right. And, and yeah, the, Chinese, gonna... the Chinese tripped up on that early on by trying to suppress evidence of the epidemic. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. Yet, was... Yes, yes, absolutely. And to, In, uh, back to the, the president kind of hypothetical situation, when did uh, we get the the information we kind of the west about the the parameters of the virus the nature of the virus and this human to human transmission because it was oh january so january 24th the papers published in the lancet uh about the first 41 cases uh that uh very strongly suggest human to human transmission so as you can see our conversation is already branching into so many areas so we right. got into uh, you know we can't do the chinese style lockdown in our countries you're right we were talking about other strengths we have, but we didn't necessarily exploit them. So I was very alarmed in, in February where there was a lot of, at the high levels of our government, to suppress scientific voices within the government, mm -hmm. which makes right. absolutely no sense in this type of a situation. I have to say, so, I'm, I'm surprised uh, that you, uh, you can say with such certainty from kind of mid-January that this thing was going to be a huge global pandemic. I, I would have thought that it could be a likely scenario or a possible scenario, but to say with such no, kind of certainty. No, no, I didn't say that. What I said was by the end of January, I was certain. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, and by, by, by January 24th, we have on the record evidence of human to human transmission. So there's no denying that. Even the CDC released in late January uh, uh, kind of a press release strongly suggesting that there was human to human transmission. And we also know from other similar pathogens, whether it's Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, the MERS virus uh, from 2012, the SARS virus from 20, 2003, there's a lot of biology here that lets us know that this was likely. So we have evidence that it's human human transmission, and then we have evidence by the end of January that an enormous force was being applied by the Chinese to stop it. So I could see no reason by the end of January to imagine why, why would the virus stop at China's borders? There's absolutely no reason it would do that. And we know from other work done by various physicists, including Alessandro Vespignani and others, uh, and also Neil Ferguson in England, people have modeled for decades, have modeled the flow of pathogens given modern um, um, transportation modes, that it was you know, going to be the virus, the genie was out of the bottle, it would be everywhere. So, so the whole of February yeah, I mean, is just kind of wasted in that sense in terms of policy response. If by, by the end of January, really, if you're looking at the reality of the situation, then, yeah, the whole month of February really was kind of what we got wrong. Oh, my goodness, yes. And, I mean, remember, we're talking now about the President of the United States, who presumably has... You asked me to imagine that I had that, uh, you know, that position, <laughs> that such an individual has access to, I think, the world's best information. And uh, so whatever you and I are reading in the newspaper on the 24th of, of January, I would imagine an individual in that situation is getting the information even sooner. So, so yes, I think it was quite clear uh, certain parameters of the virus, uh, certain the, the nature of the threat that it posed uh, certainly would have been clear by the end of January. You know, you asked originally by the end of December. I think there it's harder to be certain uh, by the end of, of December. But I mean, at least from the public information, 
maybe there's private intelligence information that someone had. I, I want to say, though, it, it's been surprising to me how many Western governments were caught flat-footed. Mm, mm. You know, it was not just the United States that lost the month of February and even part of March. Um, and I know it's difficult for politicians to often to do the right thing, but um, but there were many scientists, myself included, that were sounding the alarm, you know, throughout February. This is not an unheard of thing. I mean, there are decades of scientists who have been studying this exact topic, you know, the emergence and spread of respiratory pandemics. You know, you can reach onto my shelf over here and, and grab a book that says National Strategy for Influenza Pandemic, you know, published 15 years ago. You can open up the book and it says, they often emerge in China. They spread in this way. You know, here's what we need to do: right, right. flattening the curve. That's scary, you know, though. That's actually uh, yes, scary, scary to hear that. The, you yes. Know, every, if everything was laid out as though we should have done better, and we could have easily yes. done better, and we just yes. didn't. That's terrifying. Yes, that, it is terrifying, and it's enraging to someone like me. It's absolutely enraging. You know, it's like it's like it's like you it's like you watch the planes yep. take off from uh, Japan and fly across the Pacific, and then you're shocked, shocked to discover that Pearl Harbor's been right. bombed. Yeah. I mean, how, you know, how can you be shocked? You know, so, and, um, and historians have been writing about pandemics. You know, we had the, in, in March, uh, I think it was March 5th, which it, I, I gave a lecture to my students at Yale about how, it's online, that lecture, uh, about how I, I thought that the uh, pandemic was gonna be like the 1957 influenza pandemic given certain parameters that we knew about the lethality of the pandemic and the transmissibility of the pandemic, that the one it reminded me the most of was 57. Now, most of us don't remember 57, the 57 pandemic, for various reasons, most are your age, even my age, but, um, but historians do. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of description of what happened in 1957. So yes, it is shocking how ill, how, how, how flat-footed uh, our our response was. Now, I want to just say one thing before we move on. What China succeeded in doing by locking down a billion people in this very authoritarian way was not the eradication of the pathogen, but rather the interruption of its spread. So the virus will come back, and it's mm -hmm. going to come back to China, mm -hmm. just like it's going to come back to the Netherlands, and it's going to come back to the United States mm -hmm. and England. There is no exit for us as a species from this pathogen, but that it becomes endemic among us. That is to say, it is going to circulate in our species until we get herd immunity or we get a vaccine. So, so there will be additional waves of this pathogen. Yeah, because we definitely want to talk about that as well. But the, to put a little bit more of a concrete label on it, for instance, when you're comparing some of the Western countries, like the United States, you could arguably say has handled it very poorly. But is there a country that we can look at and just say, you know, objectively, that country has handled it better than the other countries around it. When you're talking about this, for well, instance, think, the balancing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think South Korea has done a very good job. Uh, Taiwan has done a very good job. Japan and Singapore have done nearly as good, um, although there's resurgence in both of those countries. You know, the tools at our disposal are of two broad categories, pharmaceutical interventions and so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions. Pharmaceutical interventions are medications to treat the drug, and as many of the listeners probably know, antiviral medications are very difficult compared to antibacterial medications. We have lots and lots of antibiotics that work against bacteria. We don't have very many that work very well against viruses for many reasons. It's just harder to interrupt the reproduction of viruses, first point. Second, we have vaccines, which will take time to develop, and there's a debate amongst experts as to how easy it will be to develop a vaccine against this virus. In general, I'm optimistic that we will have such a vaccine. How good it'll be, how many side effects it has, when it emerges is a bit trickier, but I think yeah. we will get one, partly because we have done it before for other mammals. So we have coronavirus vaccines for, um, for cats and pigs, also for chickens, but chickens are different. Anyway, so, um, so that's the pharmaceutical interventions. So we don't have those right now. So all, what do we got? We've got non-pharmaceutical interventions. That's behavior change by humans, either things that individuals do, like washing their hands, keeping their distance, wearing masks. Incidentally, these keeping social distance during times of plague 
has been known for hundreds or thousands of years. So plagues have been described, you know, going back 2,500 years at least in writing. And in, and for example, Thucydides in the plague of four, in Athens in 430 BC talks about how the doctors, you know, would get it more, just like now, you know, healthcare workers get the disease more. That's old. Martin Luther writes about physical distancing, you know, 400 years ago. It's, it's you know, well understood um, what to do that, in terms of individual behavior. So wearing masks, washing your hands, physical distancing, those are individual level non-pharmaceutical interventions. And then there are finally collective level non-pharmaceutical interventions, which include the banning of public gatherings, school closures, uh, and things like that. And that's why you just see the biggest variation. Closing, closing of borders, yeah. closing of borders. But I just, I'm almost done. Sorry. I'm no, no worries. Worries. Sorry, sorry, yeah. uh, so, so, But the problem is that all of that any of those things do is it just flattens a curb. It, it just stops the transmission of the virus. It doesn't eradicate the virus. So, so we do those to, to basically to, to buy ourselves some time to build our real defenses against the virus. Um, and and, so, and many countries did that effectively, you know, did those kinds of um, uh, non-pharmaceutical collective interventions effectively, including some of the ones I mentioned. And the, the country we want to talk about actually specifically is Sweden, um, because as you've kind of alluded to, you've got two options here really. I mean, if you go into lockdown, you kind of, it sounds like you're kind of trapped there in, properly until um, a vaccine comes about, or the other possible route is to go for herd immunity. And it looks like from some of the, the research coming out that actually a lot more people have this virus than we initially thought, and a lot of people are asymptomatic. And I think there's one research paper we saw, um, which hasn't been published yet, I think it's still in the, in the works, from a, a Swedish professor that said that they could reach herd immunity by the end of May, um, and that in fact some stricter preventative measures would cause human, herd immunity to never be reached. Um, so, so what, what do you, you make, make of the, the Swedish response? By the end of May, if you compare Sweden to neighboring Norway, they've had four times the deaths, and they've had an, a, a very large fraction of their elderly people, I'm sorry, not a large fraction of their elderly people have died. A large fraction of the cases that they have had have been among their elderly. You know, I think I am not as optimistic about what Sweden has done um, I, I, there are parts of the Swedish response that I like. I like the non-authoritarian way it's been done. People have been encouraged to behave well. Mostly people have behaved well. Now, they haven't uniformly done that. There have been no material in law enforcement that I'm aware of to keep people from behaving badly. And, you know, when, when you, if you are infected and you break quarantine, I, the state, have an interest in preventing you from doing that. It's not your right when you're infected to infect others. Mm. Um, and that's, that holds the world over. You, the United States can put people you know, in jail if they have to, to prevent them from infecting others. It's a public hazard. So, so the Swedes have not ad ad done anything of the kind, of course. They've just sort of encouraged people to behave well. Most people have behaved well, but not everyone. But these preventative measures, they, they delay the, the cases and yes. deaths rather than reduce them. So do you think that in a year's time, two years' time, after we see multiple waves, the, the Swedish figures compared to other countries could level out? Yes, they'll probably be the same, but let's talk a little bit about what the, let's finish on Sweden and then let's talk about what the benefits of flattening the curve are. So, so the Swedes have, uh, have done as you described. I do not believe they have the prevalence that's that high yet. I think for herd immunity for this pathogen, given an re effective reproductive rate of between two and 2.5, we're gonna need to get to 50 to 60% at least of people immune uh, you know, who've been in either by vaccination or natural immunity before we get herd immunity. And you can imagine a network, little dots and ties between them, the people that connect them. And now you suddenly imagine converting some fraction of the dots to people who can't transmit, get or transmit the infection. You should have the intuition that that's going to interrupt the flow of the pathogen through the network. So for example, if you are susceptible, but all your personal friends are immune, you don't need to be immune because it can't reach you the pathogen cannot reach you because the people you're interacting with can't give it to you, even if they were in contact with someone else who could give it to them. So they act as bulwarks against spreads. That's what herd immunity is. So 
And it, it depends a lot on the nature of the pathogen. Highly infectious pathogens like measles, you need a herd immunity. You need 96% of the people immunized or immune to stop epidemics of measles, which is why we're seeing outbreaks in the United States of measles as vaccination, you know, as the anti-vaxxers get to above 4% of the people in certain counties in California, you get outbreaks again. Um, and But for this pathogen, which is less transmissible than measles, you don't need 96% immunized. You'd need, let's say, 55, 60% immunized. So eventually, that's what's going to happen. Now, uh, uh, so, uh, so there, it, it is not a totally crazy strategy to say, look, if that's going to happen eventually, why not just take it on the chin and you know, let the pathogen kill who it's going to kill and work its way through the system? And you know, it's just a lot of us are going to die. Well, the problem is that actually millions of people could die. And not only is it difficult for a politician to just say, OK, let that happen. But I don't think that's the best that our species can do when fighting with this virus. I think we can do better than that than just throwing up our hands and saying, you know, let it kill whoever it wants to kill. I think there are mixed strategies that allow us in a graded way to allow herd immunity to arise, for example, by getting 60% of the population immune, but among, in this particular virus's case, the less susceptible young people. So for example, if you have a group of 100 people and 60 of them are under 20 and 40 of them are older than 60, and they're interacting randomly or in a network, those are different things, but let's just assume that for now. Uh, why don't we get all 60 of the young people to get the disease and be immune, since you guys can't really die from it. It's un very uncommon, mm -hmm. whereas someone like me is at higher risk. That'd be great. So a strategy of keeping the elderly isolated while the virus winds its way through is not a crazy idea. It's not exactly what the Swedes have no. done, however, because the elderly aren't being isolated to the extent necessary. So you say that's a key piece of that strategy that's, that's missing. Yes, I would yeah. say that. But furthermore, let's talk just briefly about what flattening the curve is all about. So let's say the virus is going to kill, uh, you know, 240,000 Americans, which I think it will, no matter what we do. Um, in the end, not now. I think we're going to get to maybe 100,000 or something like that with this first wave, 80,000. And then it'll come back in the fall. And then there'll be a third wave, too. And because um, there are, this is what these things do. And um, so in the end, I think it's going to kill, unfortunately, a lot of people. And uh, I don't say that lightly. I mean, it's, it's awful. You know, we're being predated by another living thing. You know, it's like an alien has come down and it wants to kill us. And we're trying to save ourselves, you know, which we're not stupid. We have tools. There's a book, you know, National Strategy for Influenza Pandemic. You can look it up and see what you should do in this situation. Anyway, so what... Why, why, why do we flatten the curve? Okay, so if they're going to be 240,000 deaths, that's 20,000. That's it, we can either have the 240,000 deaths next month, or we can have 20,000 deaths per month for a year. Now the latter is better. So we don't want all the deaths occurring at once. We want to space out the cases and the deaths. I'm speaking of deaths now. Let's let's just, let's use deaths and cases interchangeably. Actually, Actually let's, let's switch, switch to cases. cases. So let's, let's say, say they're, they're going to be, be, you know, um, ten uh, twice, twice that, 480,000 cases in the next year. I'm, I'm sorry, not cases. cases. They're going to be millions. Uh, let's, let's, let's say that they're going to be uh, 240,000, uh, 24 million cases in the next year. Therefore, uh, you know, do we want all of those in the same month or do we want to space them out? Okay. When we, social, when we physically distance and we adopt these non-pharmaceutical interventions that I discussed earlier and we lower the case count, we flatten the curve. So now the cases are distributed more uniformly. And this has at least three benefits. The first benefit is we don't overwhelm our healthcare system. So not everyone goes to the hospital this month. That allows our supply chains and our healthcare system to work to maybe save more lives. So instead of 240,000 people dying, Maybe 200,000 die. We save 40,000 lives because we have a functional healthcare system. We've not inundated it and collapsed it like happened in Wuhan, like happened in Lombardy, like almost happened, sort of happened in New York City. This virus is hitting us like a wave. Even if it were the flu, even if it were just as deadly as the flu, remember the flu cases are spread out. We don't get all our flu deaths this month. This is a percussive wave that's hitting us. It's a new pathogen 
that's spreading through the system. So it's hitting us like a wave. We're trying to blunt, we're trying to build breakwaters to blunt the force of the wave and spread out the waves. So all the water doesn't come ashore at once. It comes little by little. So when we flatten the curve, we allow our healthcare system to work. Maybe if it's working better, we prevent some deaths. That's the first benefit. The second benefit is we push some cases off into the future. Maybe by then we will have invented a drug or a vaccine. So cases that would have occurred today now occur in a year. In a year, we know more about how to deal with a, with a situation. Maybe we have a vaccine. Maybe we prevent some of those cases or prevent some of those deaths. Maybe we have better treatments. So again, we're better. So pushing it into the future is helpful in that second way as well. Third, it is typical for these pathogens to mutate to become less severe as time goes by. That's not always the case. Sometimes they become worse, but usually they become less severe. And the reason is that from the point of view of the pathogen, it doesn't want to kill us. If it kills us too fast, we don't spread it. So it wants just to make us sick so that we give it to someone else. So milder forms of the disease, which can still immunize us, in generally speaking, uh, are better. So if we push cases out into the future, those people will be infected with what ultimately is a milder version of this virus mm -hmm. rather than a serious version. Mm -hmm. So this is why we're flattening the curve, mm -hmm. to save lives in this fashion. And, and we need to acknowledge, however, that this behavior that we're engaged in also it saves lives in other ways. For example, traffic accidents have dramatically fallen in the Western world. In the United States, we have, we've had a month with no school shootings. Isn't that incredible? Uh, no school shootings for a month in the United States. So we're saving those lives. So we're saving lots of other lives that way, but we're also losing lives. We have, um, we have more um, people dying of heart attacks because they aren't seeking medical care, probably more suicides, uh, maybe more domestic violence. So you can add all that up if you're a utilitarian public health official and you can make a calculation. Poverty, people are losing their jobs, nutritional deficits. So you can add all that up and you can decide, is it worth it to do it? And for me, and I'm almost done, for me, this is a strict public health kind of calculation. So if you showed me data that said this lockdown is costing more lives than it's saving, I would say then unfortunately, all our choices are awful, but we should end the lockdown because it's more deadly than not. Yeah. So we do need to make a slight tough bridge here, which you already mentioned uh, earlier which is the cases of South Korea and Taiwan having also a different culture uh, than the United States and that actually impacting it. And I'm just or wondering, the Netherlands. yeah, also in the Netherlands, but in the United States, you're seeing like pretty intense protests, I would say, in California about, you know, freedom, typical libertarian. No, 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 those are overblown. They're yeah, you think very so? small. Yeah, they've gotten a lot. That's the nature of protests. You have small mm. groups of people that can get into the public eye. Uh, these, these are very small groups of people. Um, so, yes, there are some people who but object. You don't, but if you, for instance, let's not even just necessarily take, because you have the people that go and protest, but you also have a general sentiment as well. Like if you were looking at Florida, people that still want to do spring break and all that kind of. Uh, yeah, there are you know. some people, but the majority of Americans, and we know this from behavioral data. So, for yeah. example, we know even before the governments imposed lockdowns, if you use uh, restaurant reservation apps, for example, yeah. or mobility data, uh, you can see that even two weeks before governors imposed rules uh, constraining uh, uh, these sorts of behaviors, uh, people are not stupid. They stopped going to restaurants. Mm -hmm. So m there are some people who don't care, don't believe it, feel they're not likely to get it. Let's say they're young or they're immature. You know, they, you know, like sometimes young people can be immature and make stupid decisions, you know, about various oh, sorts of things. Oh. <laughs> uh, you know, they do things that they regret. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, um, so it's yes, there are such. But it's a mistake how we're viewing these kind of protests and the, the general attitude. Because for us, it's a bit weird from the outside. You know, if you're looking at, for instance, you know, Free Michigan, I think was what they were talking about, or these kind of anti-vaxxers movements. Yeah, I don't even want to give them any attention. I yeah. think they're very small groups of people. Yeah, yeah. And uh, now the anti-vaxxers are a larger group of people, and those people are harming our society. Yeah. Um, I think the anti-vaccination movement has been extremely counterproductive, uh, is scientifically unsound, and has been, um, you know, has been a net cost to our society. I, I'm not saying that vaccines are perfectly safe. They're not. Okay, you know, one in a million people will have a complication. Uh, 
But as you said, the utilitarian public health official, yeah. that by that calculus oh, it's, is clear. The case is indisputable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. indisputable yeah. Uh, about the benefits of vaccination for so many diseases, yeah. uh, for the individual getting the vaccine and for the society as a whole. So, so the anti-vaxxers are more numerous. The people that are protesting, I think that's, um, they're not that numerous. Now, it is, in the, it is the case that people do tire of such physical distancing measures. It's always been the case. So after you've been at home for two months, the spring is coming. Uh, you know, maybe there, maybe the, you don't hear such bad news anymore. Uh, we flatten the curve some. So you're thinking, oh my God, there's a lot of people who think very stupidly, oh my God, we've succeeded. We flattened the curve. We're done. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. First, a thousand people a day are still dying. That's what flatten the curve means. It means the cases aren't increasing, but every single day there's a toll of death that we're still paying. And second, and second, it's just the first wave. Mm -hmm. You know, so we kind of blunted the first wave. There's going to be a second wave as well, and a third. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so anyway, but people feel victorious. There's, they get tired of being at home. They, they are going to break uh, curfew. So the question is how, as a society, can we gently release some of the steam so that people can, let's say, go out to public parks and keep their physical distance, begin to do a little bit of this, and the virus will come back a little bit and then slowly build some herd immunity while still protecting the vulnerable members of our society. Then this is also, I mean, I also see this as another kind of example of uh, a pro for the, the Swedish case. Because if you are, if you kind of say psychologically at least, people are willing, we've seen actually being quite willing to accept this first lockdown and these drastic measures, but the chances of them, you know, accepting a, a second lockdown because of a second wave and constant, consistently going kind of back and forth between being stuck at home and being allowed to go outside the the cases of compliance i know i would say are just going to drop and then if that's going to happen and you get more people outside you want uh, the society as a whole to have had more cases up to that point instead of it just being you know like a field of kindling for the virus to, to burn yes the, you're you're right and it's complicated and people have modeled like how do you turn on and off the physical distancing in a fashion that is optimal in the end? Mm. You know, can you calibrate it so that you kind of get build up some herd immunity and um, without irritating the public and, and, and keep people engaged? But I need to remind you of something. We will soon get to a time when most people in your country and in mine will um, know someone who died of the virus. Mm. And when that happens, I think you're going to see a difference in public opinion. Yeah, yeah. You know, when, That's a really good um, point, actually, yeah. Yeah, when we get right now, it may seem very distant, yeah, you know? Yeah. And everyone is locked down, and millions of people have lost their jobs, and it's, it's awful. But the threat seems very abstract. But the problem with these threats, and the problem, in fact, with any kind of epidemic growth, which is, again, why so many people were so foolish in January, is because they're hearing people like me sound the alarm, but they don't see anything wrong. Right? Everything looks fine. What are you talking about? Mm. A threat is coming? What do you mean? Everything is fine. Mm. And because that's what happens with, as you studied in high school calculus, that's what happens with exponential growth, right? It's like, mm. it's going along, it's going along, nothing is happening, nothing is happening. Oh, there's no, a lot is happening all of a sudden. Mm. No. And uh, you can say, thank your high school math teacher that taught you about exponential growth, right. Right. you know. And uh, the politicians didn't know about it come the end of January. They, they didn't go to high school or no, a good yeah. one, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> but, 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 the point is, but the point is, by the time you're on the steep part of the curve, it's too late to do anything. Mm -hmm. So this is the problem. If we wait until everyone knows someone who's died of the virus, and then they're like, oh, my God, this is right. serious. Yeah. By then, you know, it, it's too late to do much at all. And so this yeah. is the challenge. You know, how do we mobilize the public? And this is where the public health education component comes in. This is where a key part of this has to be, and this is why I was so upset with many politicians, especially in our country, is the not taking their duty as educators seriously, mm -hmm. right? It's not just about deploying resources. It's not just about um, stealing the public for the battle ahead, right? Like preparing people, this is gonna suck, mm -hmm. right? how are, you know, we need to band together as a nation to cope with this awfulness that's about to afflict us. Mm. But it's also about just basic education. Let me teach you. Like Angela Merkel has been incredible. Yeah, you know, yeah. you, 
you, you know, she's just like, let me get you some basic information yeah. about what the RE means. Right. You know, yeah. RE is 1.1, it means this, and if it's 1.4, it means that, and, you know, here's what, and let me educate you. Here's why we're doing this. Here's, you know, this, the bully pulpit, the use of the bully pulpit, I think is incredibly important for public education because we're going to have to, like the Swedes, at a minimum, we're going to have to rely on the willingness of the public to do what's necessary to confront this epidemic. Mm, mm, indeed. We want to talk a little bit um, about kind of the future and when we're going to look back on this virus, how we're going to perceive the whole thing. And in particular, we want to talk about China. So China has kind of pretty actively suppressed doctors and information, specifically at the, the beginning of the outbreak. And, you know, you could argue, and people have argued, this has had drastic repercussions throughout the world as a result. So what, what do you think should be the proper international reaction against China and their behavior early on after this whole thing blows over? Well, first of all, I'll say while I'm no fan of the Chinese Communist Party and I obviously like, I do not like authoritarian forms of government on the far right or on the far left. I've been extremely concerned in Hungary where the parliament has voted to suspend itself. Awful. You know, that's a right-wing yeah. government with yeah. Orban. You have left-wing governments. You know, I'm a very sort of left of center politically myself, but like like kind of Western democracy with protection of civil liberties and, you know, the kind of European sort of governmental systems we have in place. Pretty reasonable. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, exactly. They're very reasonable. Fan in Elmer. He, he will <laughs> yeah, <agree> exactly. <laughs> so, um, so, and it is the case that the state in China can silence dissent and does silence dissent and has silenced dissent for a very long time. However, the Americans haven't been so great about this either. Now, it's not the state that's been acting, but many hospitals, for example, have fired nurses and doctors for making social media posts about you know, the lack of personal protective equipment at their hospitals or people who've been warning about stuff. You know, we, we, we're not prepared to take care of the cases here. Those people have been fired. And um, terrible. for and told to shut up like Messed little, up. yes. And I did an interview about this a month ago with uh, Connor Friedersdorf on the Atlantic, where I really expressed my strong distaste mm. because this idea that we can fight the virus by shutting people up is just insane. Yeah. Yes, there will be snake oil salesmen. Yes, there will be people who lie to us and try to sell forsythia, like in the movie Contagion. Yep. Yes, there will be people who say use bleach, <laughs> you know, or or put light in your behind or something, yeah. you know. Yes, there will be people who say very stupid and wrong things, but we are not going to win the battle. The, the way to handle those people is to is to answer them with the truth and say, mm -hmm. you said this, this is false. Let me explain to you why it's false. That enhances credibility. It gets the public behind you, sort of believing they can trust your voice and more willing then to listen to you when you go out on a limb and you say something. So in my, my feeling is that the most effective way to fight the virus is with information and truth. Now, so, so it is the case how, so the United States has its own issues in this regard with a suppression of information and so forth. Again, it's not the government acting, it is different. It's, you can't be hauled away to prison for you know, saying the wrong thing. Um, you know, we don't have, um, you can't be accused of rumor mongering. Um, but, you know, and also, and also social media companies, some of them are clamping down on what people can say. Now, they're doing it with good intentions, you know, like people are spreading ridiculous, you know, rumors that the virus is caused by, I don't know what. But, um, so I'm in favor of openness of information, and I certainly do not admire what the Chinese have done in that regard. Now, I believe that now the Chinese, the, the incentives in China have switched for accurate reporting of the cases because they need accurate surveillance. If they're going to control the virus, they can't have people on the ground afraid to report it. Right. You know, so, and in fact, the paper that we just came out today provides some evidence for the accuracy of the Chinese reporting later in the course of the epidemic. Through February the 19th, we can validate the Chinese numbers using a certain tool or technique that we employed. So, um, so now what happens in the end, I don't know. I mean, I think that Many of these serious viruses have emerged from the consumption of wild animals in China and in other parts of the world. And I think the Chinese are going to have to take a serious look at, you know, they have an ancient cuisine of which they're very proud. The Chinese famously eat everything. 
but you know maybe in the 21st century that is not a reasonable way to proceed or much tougher standards are going to be needed if you're going to eat civets or snakes or pangolins or raccoons or badgers or dogs you know you're, we're going to need uh, the government the chinese or people themselves are going to have to say you know what maybe we need to control that a bit more because we don't like the price we have to pay in order to eat these delicacies but what if they um, don't right because there have been wet markets in the past that have led to problems and the Chinese yes. state still failed to enforce adequately right that's what we're seeing now i mean i don't know if they don't like what you know what um what 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 power do nations have to enforce to manage the internal affairs of other countries is difficult we could certainly threaten them with trade sanctions you know we can uh, we can make demands that they you know allow inspections just like we do with like nuclear treaties you know uh you know i, I don't know i mean i do think that and incidentally I, I think the chinese are a victim of this too in the sense that i don't think if you had asked anyone in china should we be eating unusual animals in the southern part of the country uh, and the rest of us, a billion of us will go home for uh, three months. I, I just don't think they would have made that choice yeah. either. I mean, I don't think they're going to be very happy with this. So, um, you know, it's going to, it has ruined their economy. And, and even if, even if the Chinese are able to stand up their economy again, the rest of the world isn't going to be buying stuff for a while. Mm. So their people will be immiserated by this. They will be, they, they, you know, China has had like 40 years or something of nonstop economic growth which is one of the ways the Communist Party has stayed in power is because they have been able to manage this growth. It's going to be a threat, right? This is the, 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 you know, the, the increasing po poverty in China as a result of this economic collapse is a problem. So I think incentives are going to be aligned. Nobody, nobody likes, there's nobody who like, that I can imagine who likes what we've experienced in the last few months. Yeah. So, just adding this, this is a personal dilemma, James, and if I and have had personally, which is Trump calling it the Chinese virus, right? And also yes. calling it the Wuhan virus. And yes. when you're talking about incentives, right? Th there's a part of me that can also understand why we would label it the Wuhan virus so people don't forget the original cause, which may yes. be a market. But there's also the, the concept that it's going to incentivize racism and stuff like that. What do yes. you make of that? Well, I think there's a long tradition in infectious disease of naming pathogens for their origin. You know, we have Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Or Lyme's we have disease. Ebola. What? Lyme's disease. Lyme, Connecticut. Yeah, Lyme disease from Lyme, Connecticut. We, we've got, you know, the Spanish flu. Actually, the Spanish flu in 1918 didn't come from Spain. Yeah. It, you don't know where it came from. It may have actually come from Wyoming. Uh, you know, uh, we have Middle Eastern respiratory, you know, syndrome, MERS, you know, uh, we have, um, the, you know, there was in previous times, we talked about the Hong Kong flu, et cetera. I mean, there's a long tradition. Zika is named, you know, after a region. So there's a long tradition of naming um, diseases after the origin or where they're first identified. I don't necessarily see that as problematic intrinsically. But of course, it can be abused, right, like any other kind of propaganda. And I, I don't think the, the president of the United States was innocently talking about the Wuhan virus or whatever. Remember, even in China, they called it the Wuhan pneumonia for a while, right? During the month of January and uh, February, there were a lot of Baidu searches in China where people were searching for Wuhan pneumonia, right? They were, what's happening in Wuhan? Mm -hmm. I hear there's something happening there. You know, what's the disease? So, um, so I, again, I, I don't think it's intrinsically problematic, and it has for, you know, hundreds of years been customary to name, often, not always, name pathogens after, you know, where they emerged. But that doesn't mean we should, we should, um, you know, forget about uh, the consequences and be ignorant. Yes, and we can also change. Just like we a moment ago, we said that Chinese dietary practices could change. Our naming conventions could change. Right. You know, we don't have to keep yeah. using, you know, geographic locations to name pathogens. Yeah. So, I mean, this has kind of been always kind of difficult for us to grapple with because, at the same time, I think we can place a lot of blame on how Donald Trump has handled is currently in the United States, for instance, not using the Defense Act and et cetera, et cetera. But I also worry that sometimes there's a little bit less critique that's being placed at, for instance, China, or for that matter, also the World Health Organization. So the fact that, for instance, that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that they actually went for an investigation by the advice of Taiwanese officials, and then afterwards they said that human-to-human -human transition uh, transmission wasn't, I think, possible or happening. I'm just, I'm wondering if there is 
if it's actually acceptable, for instance, for the Trump administration to critique the World Health Organization. Maybe not from their position, but if it's a general critique that we can share. Well, I don't know enough about the politics of the WHO. Um, there was a time when the WHO was was illustrious, you know, for example, the global suppression of, of uh, smallpox uh, and, you know, ongoing efforts to eradicate polio. Those diseases, by the way, were eradicatable because they don't, they're no, they're no uh, uh, zoonotic reservoirs. Like once we eliminate them from humans, then they're gone from the planet. So, you know, those were miraculous accomplishments, the um, elimination of smallpox, for instance, which was a deadly scourge uh, for human beings for a very long time. And the WHO was instrumental in that and rightly gets credit. So my, my general disposition towards the WHO is that a well-functioning organization like the WHO should exist and should be supported. Now, whether it's well-functioning today and how it's been politicized and who's controlling it and all of that stuff, I don't know. I haven't made a deep study of it. I am aware of the fact that there was a, uh, a report from the middle of January from the WHO that suggested that coronavirus may not have human-to-human -human or did not have human-to-human -human transmission, which was wrong. And, uh, and, it, and, and how they came to that wrong conclusion, I don't know. Whether they were deceived by the Chinese or, or there was no evidence that they saw or it was a good faith error, I don't know the answer to that either. But very soon afterwards, the WHO did change tune. Yep. And in any case, it was widely known that there was human to human transmission. There was a delegation of experts that went to Wuhan in uh, sort of just after the middle of January and saw what was happening there, the Chinese experts. And that's what led to the lockdown of the country. So, um, and as we were talking about earlier, intelligence agencies in the United States knew about this in December, maybe even. So, you know, I'm not. And do you think I should, I want to just, yeah. actually we're doing a role play of the, this interview and kind of just talking about the questions and, uh, you know, potential responses. And, you know, you see in a lot of newspaper articles and we've talked about it a little bit, kind of critiquing China or the US or the World Health Organization and I was just wondering, do you think that actually this, the blame game should wait? And that actually what's more important now is focusing yeah. on, you know, the next action, the next step, what's happening tomorrow, rather than what happened in the beginning of January or February or, you know. Early. Yes. In general, I would agree we should avoid the blame game now. But the problem is some politicians are still doing stupid and dangerous things. Yeah. So if it's one thing, like, let's say you're, you know, like Bill de Blasio, the, uh, the, you know, like my favorite political targets outside of um, the president of the United States are the Democratic mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio, and the Republican governor Blasio. of Florida, DeSantis, who have both been saying very stupid things for a very long time. Uh, and actually even the governor of Georgia, where the CDC is. Like for the governor of Georgia to say two weeks ago that he just discovered that there was human-to-human -human transmission is absurd. That's like a willful yeah, ignorance. Yeah, you know, yeah. if you're the governor of a major United States state with this responsibility that has the world's leading, leading center for knowledge about this topic in your state, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia, you pick up the damn phone and you call someone there and you say, what can you brief me? Please come and brief me mm. about what's known. That's willful ignorance, mm. okay? Mm. Willful. So the problem is a lot of these politicians, it's one thing to say, well, we didn't know what was happening back then you know, January, February, but they're still saying and doing stupid things. Right. And for this, I do not think they can avoid blame, okay? No. Because they're harming us now. They are actively harming us by these lies. You get the president that stands up and says, you know, cover yourself in bleach, or can you eat the bleach? Can you <laughs> eat the bleach? You know, it's, it's, it's stupid. Yeah, or, yeah. or promoting hydroxychloroquine when there's no evidence, you know, uh, for hydroxychloroquine. I mean, it may, in a randomized controlled trial, ultimately prove to have some benefit, but it's unlikely, and then we have no evidence for it now, no good evidence. So this is dangerous for the president to be promoting these things, and he should not be doing that, and he should be held responsible today. But there is, a, there is a, I, think, I believe anyway, there is kind of a, a qualitative difference between someone like you in your position as a professor with the information, with the expertise to kind of speak truth to power, so to speak, um, compared to you know, politicians engaging in political games, uh, you know, trying uh, power battles and saying, "Oh, China did this," or the "Who did that?" You know, it it very much depends on who the the person critiquing whatever they're critiquing is. Yes, I, I think that is also true, and I also think that there's going to be a run for cover. Everyone's there's a lot of finger pointing. You know, who can blame who else? Um, you know, and I think. Um, 
you know, I, I think, you know, even now we've been talking about China and the United States. I mean, what's the excuse of other European, you know, other leaders, far left and far right and centrist governments throughout Europe were really caught flat footed here. I had the privilege of uh, speaking to and advising uh, the prime minister of Greece. And, um, you know, I think the Greek response has been very swift and effective in part because they had the fear of God put in them from what they saw happening in Italy. Mm. So as soon as the Italian situation occurred, you know, I think the Greeks really responded extremely fast and effectively. Now, there's some misunderstanding in Greece right now that this means, oh, they won the battle. Mm. That's not the case. They just stopped the first wave. Yeah. They, they still have to fight and uh, think about how they're going to cope with the return of the virus. And then there's the contrast between, you know, Spain and Portugal, for example, uh, or Spain and Greece. You know, Spain has a very divided government and they're not able to coordinate well, whereas Greece has, you know, one party in power right now. It happens to be a right of center party, but I don't think it would have mattered. I think when you have political divisions, it's difficult to coordinate action. Or Portugal is doing better than Spain, for instance. Yeah. Um, and there's some crazy theories about that as well. So anyhow. Yeah, so we have to interrupt because we're almost out of time. Yes. We want to ask one last question, which we know is a bit of speculation, but just for the sake of it. How long do you think we will have until a vaccine? Uh, we kind of win the battle. Uh, I, I think we are, I think there's a very good chance we'll have a vaccine in about 18 months. I think it will take time to manufacture and distribute the vaccine and then time for people around the world to get used to the new normal. So I don't think we're going to return to life as usual for another three or four years. And is there, is there any possibility that um, this Could vaccine you? could prove ineffective the year after? I mean, if the coronavirus yes. is going to Oh, no. That's a whole other complicated topic right. as to what, how much immunity it confers yeah, and yeah. Uh, whether the virus will mutate to avoid it and, uh, and uh, whether you'll need to get serial vaccination like the flu. I think we're going to have multiple vaccines that work in different ways. And my only concern with that right now, well, there's a small chance we never will have a vaccine. That's possible, but unlikely. Uh, but my only concern now is we're rushing to develop a vaccine in a way that will have the vaccine be much less safe than usual. So usually earlier we spoke about how one in a million people might be adversely yeah. affected by a vaccine. In this case, it might be one in 10,000. And, you know, we'll be hearing about yeah. that. Yeah, that goes back into the, you know, the utilitarian calculus that you have to yes. perform. It's tricky. It's tricky. Well, anyways, uh, Professor Kostakis, thank you very much uh, for joining thank us Thank you today. for having me. And uh, more information is available at my, at my uh, lab website, which is www humannaturelab.net, humannaturelab.net, and I had a book just published out in paperback called a Blueprint, The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society. Yes. You can also get an audiobook or a Kindle, and there's lots of good stuff there if you're interested. We'll terrific. link all yeah. of them uh, to the description. Yeah, yeah, well. really want to yeah. read that book. It yeah. looks yeah, right up my Thank street. Thank you. So. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. You're Mr. welcome. Bye-bye. Right. right.